name is Piper Passnick, and I'm going to be presenting for you. This is like in a little bit of place. Okay. Uh, rediscovering the role of the contralto in the operas of Giochino Rossini. Introduction. The definition of the term contralto, from its earliest appearance to current use, is wide-ranging. It holds a distinction in moving fluidly between genders without changing range or tessitura. And to this day in opera, the current definition frequently gives little insight into the gender of the character being sung. If one sees the role of contralto listed on the score, they are just as likely to be looking at a male character as a female. This unique origin separates the voice historically from the mezzo-soprano, though in recent years the two voice types have become somewhat synonymous. To find a distinction, it is helpful to look at the prolific and significant role of the contralto in the operas of Giochino Rossini. For Rossini, his preferred voice was the contralto, which carried with it the possibility of being sung by both men and women and represented for him the most natural presentation of the human voice. The contralto is the norm. One should concentrate on the central register in order to always be in tune. At the extreme ends which you gain in force, you often lose in grace. And by this abuse, you paralyze the throat, resorting as a remedy to canto declamato, that is, out of tune shouting. <laughs> For Rossini, this range allowed him a freedom, freedom in composing to focus, much like his Baroque predecessors, on a primary line which did not practice extremes, and to think of the upper and lower harmonies as secondary, which in the drama of opera, translates to secondary characters as well. Now, nearly 200 years after the death of Rossini, the taste for these voice types has evolved. Subsequent composers have led the average, average opera listener to expect the primary role to be sung by a tenor or a soprano, utilizing the highest reaches of their range to expose the most dramatic moments. The importance placed on the extremes of vocal ranges has also replaced the concept of gender, gender interchangeability. And so therefore, the middle voice as a heroic or primary character has become a rarity. This rarity has certainly had some bearing on how voices are marketed, taught, and labeled. Table one demonstrates the modern casting of a role that will be examined here, that of Isabella in Italiani in Algeri. Originally written for a contralto, this role is now sung almost exclusively by those using the label mezzo-soprano. While this table indicates only performances between 2015 and 2017, it's representative of the same patterns that we've found over the past few decades. This leads one to ask whether there is a modern distinction between the two beyond the semantic, and if so, can it be reconciled with the current definition? In the early 20th century, author Pitt Sanborn wrote The Doom of the Contralto, in which he states three generations of composers with the futures of their operas rather than the contralto voice at heart, have neglected them. Eric Myers from Opera News points out the Metropolitan Opera, for example, does not list contraltos on its register at all, classifying female singers as either soprano or mezzo-soprano. And J.B. Steen, in the chapter of his book devoted to contraltos, says one searches for the really deep voices, and they seem to be almost extinct. In this lecture, I will focus on the historic thread of Handel's primo uomo and its effect on the compositions of Rossini. In addition, I will focus on his writing for the well-known contralto Marietta Marcolini, who demonstrates the style and range frequently used in, by Rossini in writing for the contralto voice, and contrast this with the other lead female roles composed by Rossini, such as Desdemona in his Otello, sung famously by both Isabella Cobran and Judith de Pasta. Statement of thesis. The contralto and mezzo-soprano labels are often treated as interchangeable in the modern opera world. By looking at Giochino Rossini's operas, specifically focusing on character, tessitura, range, vocal pairing, and color, and his passion for the primo uomo, as expressed by the castrato, a unique and clear contralto voice can be found. This provides substantial evidence of the need for separating the two labels as distinct and necessary for expressing these works. History of the contralto voice, the genesis of the contralto. In the beginning, there was polyphony, writes historian Francois Veld, and it was, like Gaul, divided into three parts, the superior or discontus, 
the tenor, and the contratenor. The earliest origins of the term contralto can be discovered in plain chant. Essentially, the third voice, or contratenor, was a voice similar to the range of the tenor, which was written after the tenor part, tenor here meaning held or primary, and designed to act as a complement to that part. In the middle of the 15th century, as the medieval ear became more accustomed to complex harmonies, this contratenor line was divided into two parts, the higher of which was the contratenor altus and the lower the contratenor basus. At that time, the term contratenor was still attached, but it was so lengthy that most started using the shorter, more descriptive terms altus and basus. The altus part was generally assigned just a little above the tenor, occasionally overlapping as the basus fell below it. Over the next century of music writing, these ranges became more well-defined in their use, and the altus began to move a bit higher. At the same time, the language of music was leaving the church, straying from the Latin to the local languages. Thus, in Italy, the contratenor altus became the contralto, or the much-used abbreviation alto, and the same part in England became the countertenor. In that time period, the contralto voice is understood to be a partner to the tenor, both occupying the same basic middle of the voice, male or female. The superius, the voice which would later be called the soprano, functioned as an upper harmony. It's essential here to understand that the primary melody was often found in the tenor voice, and the tenor voice was very similar in range to the contratenor or the contralto. Simon Ravens explains in his book, Supernatural Voice, A History of High Male Singing, that the origins of the contralto voice are found during the Baroque period. He adds an early description, contralto, a countertenor, or a voice of higher pitch than a tenor, but lower than a treble. Ravens points out that what made this voice type unique is the mysterious lack of gender. Vell agrees and notes the importance of understanding that this contralto or contratenor voice was certainly not defined by the human being singing it, but much more by the range and tessitura of that part. Appearance of the contralto in Baroque music. Due to restrictions of the church, castrati were prominent in Venetian opera from the beginning. Although women were not everywhere in Italy forbidden to appear on the stage as they were in Rome, there was a considerable prejudice against them on moral rather than religious grounds. And in some other cities, they were barred from the stage until well into the 18th century. While women could replace both castrati and voci naturali, meaning men who sang naturally up into their falsetto ranges, toward the end of the 18th century, the term contralto became applied more and more frequently to women, with the English distinction of the male alto still existing, likely because of their choral tradition and the success of Handel's altos. Handel's fondness for the heroic contralto range and its foreignness to the modern ear is shown in the casting of his opera Amadigi di Gaula. This opera, which was immensely successful in its 1715 performances at the King's Theater, featured only five characters. The heroic lead, Amadigi, was a male character sung by the very well-known alto castrato, Niccolo Grimaldi, also better known as Niccolini, and all the other characters ranging from contralto to soprano were sung by women. Handel's premier cast of Amadigi di Gala did not generally feature mezzo-sopranos. He divided the, two, uh, the female voice into two types, a contralto voice, lower in tessitura than a modern mezzo, and a soprano voice, somewhat similar to the tessitura of a modern lyric mezzo-soprano, which here in the case of Amadi G. Gaula would mean a voice not generally going above the staff, with the exception of possible ornaments that are not written to the score. Originally written for a male contralto, the role of Amadi G. is easily transferred into the voice of a female, without alteration or any octave displacement. In terms of range and tessitura, this aria fits in exactly with the expectations of the modern contralto. It also serves as an excellent example, example of the primo uomo of opera seria, and a character that could have been sung by either gender. Rhodes defines the primo uomo in three ways. Oh, let me that for them. The first, by convention, the primo uomo was a young prince or leading rebel, and almost invariably a lover, but not necessarily the title role, which might be a ruler or a tyrant. Two, leading castrati were often identified by vocal range rather than by role. And three, in 18th century opera seria, the role of primo uomo was generally assigned to a castrato, but on occasion to a woman, 
With the decrease in availability and decline in popularity of the operatic castrato after 1800, the leading male role, or the lover of the young rebel, came to be cast first as a woman, and thereafter, when the practice was put to death around 1850, as a tenor. Here I will sing Susurate on le Amadigi's aria, which opens the second act. In it, Amadigi addresses the fountain of love. This music was composed in the same year as Handel's water music, and the effect of the flowing water is not lost on audiences. In Act Two, Amadigi addresses the fountain of true love in a slow, moving recitative and aria. This scene was famous originally for its spectacular stage effects as they recreated the fountain.
at the end of the castrato age and into the post castrato age. This range, which bridges the male and female voices, could be just as powerful when sung by women, frequently and understandably playing the roles of the heroic male stars that had graced the Baroque opera stage. Rodolfo Cioletti points out, the contralto voice at the end of the 18th century and in the first few years of the 19th century is seen as extremely flexible, varied in form, and often free from problems of range. He goes on to quote Théophile Gautier when he heard Marietta Alboni, one of the great Rossini contraltos, a voice at once so feminine and yet so male, Romeo and Juliet in the same throat. Though some tenor roles were coming into acceptance as the young hero, the lead role was often still reserved for castrati and particularly contraltos at the turn of the 19th century. Here we see an emergence of the contralto musico, a female voice type which specializes in roles written for castrati, or even performances of roles which were traditionally sung by castrati whether or not they were written as such. As this trend progressed, and castrati began to be more and more scarce, as well as men trained to sing with their falsetto rather than their chest voice, more of these musical roles were written for female contraltos. While Rossini has been the main proponent of this, other composers such as Donizetti, Meyerbeer, Mercadante, and Bellini were actively composing these musico or pants roles to appease audiences whose tastes had been trained around the female contralto color. This required a number of singers who may have actually been sopranos or even mezzos, fulfilling the practical purpose of replacing a contralto or castrato for whom a role was written. As Cialetti writes, the mezzo-soprano did not enjoy autonomy in respect of timbre. Hence, high or even very high mezzo-sopranos passed for contractos. Singers like Colbran, Pasta, Malibran, Unger, all of whom became sopranos in the second half of their careers. This certainly was due to the availability of soprano roles increasing, but also the possible declines in their ability to switch registers. During Rossini's life, a number of bel canto composers, including the very popular Vincenzo Bellini and Gaetano Donizetti, began casting lead roles in the soprano voice, with the secondary roles as mezzo-soprano. Mezzo-soprano Marilyn Horn, on the subject of the contralto role in Italian opera, notes this awkward transition. Bellini wrote very high for Adalgisa, she says, and even for Romeo and Capuletti. The very mezzo roles that followed were high, and since then, that time, since that time, these vocal categories have gotten confused. Giochino Rossini. Uh, Giochino Rossini was born in Bologna in 1792 to two musical parents. His father, famously a trumpeter, and then later a teacher of Bologna, Zaccarini Filarmonica, and his mother, who could not read music but sang professionally, first at the Teatro della Fenice as a second soprano in the chorus, and then later as a prima donna assoluta at the Teatro Comunale in Bagna Cavallo. She had 15 roles in her repertory, all of them comic. It can be said that Rossini's earliest compositions were inspired by his mother, whom he joined on stage in duets as early as age 14. Rossini himself was a boy alto and was admitted to the Academy in Bologna, also known as the Licea Musicale, for his practice of the musical art of singing, and he spoke out that life as a castrato had not been an option. Though they were not wealthy, Rossini recounted that as his uncle pushed for his mother to make him a castrato, citing the possibility of a life of wealth, my brave mother would not consent at any price. <laughs> However, the influence of castrati during his musical upbringing was profound. While at the Liceo, Rossini was exposed to two singers by whom he was later influenced greatly, castrato Giovanni Battista Valuti and the soprano Isabella Colbran, who would later become Rossini's muse, partner, and wife. Hearing them sing together must have been pivotal for Rossini. While he was clearly moved by the singing actress that was Colbran, having been immersed in the theater already, he was profoundly impacted by the old order that was dying out. The beauty of the bel canto style is demonstrated by the castrati. I have never forgotten them, he says. The purity, the miracle, uh, Sorry, the purity, the miraculous flexibility of those voices, and above all, their profoundly penetrating accent. All that moved and fascinated me more than I can tell. I should add that I myself wrote a role for one of them, one of the last but not the least, Valuti, that was in my opera Aureliano in Palmira. For Rossini, there was no better teacher of bel canto singing than the castrati. He told Wagner in 1860, 
eight years before his death. The Castrati were incomparable teachers. The teaching of singing in the master schools attached to the churches was entrusted to them, and those were real singing academies. Maria de Marcolini. Maria de Marcolini was a contralto, born in Florence in 1780. She was not only successful in her own right, but over the course of his career, Rossini wrote five roles for her. Ernestina in Liquidico Stravagante, Ciro in Babylonia, Clarice in La Pietra del Paragone, Isabella in Italian in Algeri, and Sigismondo in Sigismondo. Margolini was not only one of Rossini's favorite contraltos, she was his first contralto. According to Stenhall's highly romanticized writing on the life of Rossini, she was his first muse. It was not long before Margolini, this is a quote, delightful cantatrice buffa, and at the same time a woman in the fullest flower of her youth and talent, swept him away from the great ladies who had been his finest proctresses. The gossips whispered a base ingratitude, and there were many tears shed. The Critico Stravagante, referred to as an operatic drama, uh, drama giocoso, or playful drama, was Rossini's first attempt at a two-act opera. It had only a few performances, likely due to its controversial political subject matter of a military deserter. Though the opera was not ultimately successful, it was Rossini's first work with contralto Maria de Margolini, who was cast as the primary female character, Ernestina. In keeping with Rossini's casting taste, the smaller, of Ernestina, the smaller role of Ernestina's maid is slightly higher than the main role, and notably a mezzo-soprano. Analyzing Rossini's writing for the contralto Maria de Margolini, characters. Marietta Margolini was certainly a gifted comic actress, at least to the taste of Rossini, and her voice was recognized by other composers as well. While Stendhal's comments on her could be the result of gossip or imagination, it is known that she appeared in a number of the composer's other works, primarily as the prima donna. By the time she met the 19-year-old Rossini in 1811, Margolini was an established star, renowned in the operas of Ferdinando Payer as well as the German composer Simone Meyer who was notably the teacher of Donizetti. Looking at the roles that were created for Marcolini, a few things can be easily learned. Out of the five, <coughs> three are comic roles. Le Critico Stravagante, L'Italia in Algeri, and La Pietra del Paragone, in Rossini's style of the drama Giocoso. In all three cases, the contralto is a female lead, though admittedly one disguise, but is disguised as a man who attempts to use her cleverness to outwit others on stage. In addition, she is not necessarily royal or high-born. In Italiana, the character is notably trying to avoid the romantic advances of another character, using her own schemes and plots to do so, a convention often used by Rossini. The other two are in the opera seria style. Ciro in Babylonia is the less successful of Rossini's Lenten operas, and Sigismondo, even less commercially successful at the time, is a rather complex, Otello-like story of a king who believes he's betrayed by his queen. In both cases, again, Marco Lini, the contralto lead, is the king, who is essentially the heroic center of the storyline. This is in keeping with the Italian Baroque treatment of the primo uomo, or the leading man, with a tessitura similar to the castrato voice which represented it. The leading man in Baroque opera seria, frequently someone of royalty, sometimes a tragic figure, is reinvented in opera with virtuosity being the focus, and frequently the plot of the opera playing a distant second. Quote, the barrier which is often raised between opera seria works and the listener of today consists in the fact that, theatrically speaking, Rossini's characters have an almost statuesque rigidity. Chilena points out in his book on the history of Bel Canto that although subsequent and even contemporary composers were making more use of the agitation, lack of control or passion, which the characters might be experiencing, Rossini held a fondness for the characters of Handel's operas, which stood on pedestals. Cialetti further says, when these characters suffer injury and pain, they take refuge in the realistic imitation of human beings. The extraordinary purity of certain melodies and their instrumental framework derive precisely from this sublimated view of passion, one which likewise makes for unrestraint and impetuosity, but, with a total absence of an overemphasis. It would then make great sense that these characters, both in comic and opera seria forms, would express through the center of their voice, 
the controlled reaction to that which happens around them. In the following example from Maria, one of Maria de Marcolini's roles, the character Isabella, who is trying to outwit her kidnapper, does so in an extremely controlled melody and tone. She does not leave the lower tessitura of her voice until the final measures, and her ornamentation is, frequent, is fully written out, leaving no room for improvisational commentary. Each of these, both this and the previous handle example, are not the entrance arias or cavatinas, but the second act, predictably slower and more contemplative aria of the main character. One can see here not only the similarity in the written out ornaments to that of Handel, but also Rossini's fondness for the lush middle of the contralto voice. Though it is being played by Kim Sun on the piano today, it is also notable that Rossini begins this aria with a full one minute flute solo, similar to the orchestration on Amanici di Bella. Even though it's written nearly 100 years later, it establishes the delicacy and extremely light ornamentation of this aria, and the contralto flute combination was quite well liked and often used by Rossini. Also cut today is the trio of men who are occasionally interrupting with musical commentary. <laughs>
Cobrano has been referred to as a dramatic coloratura soprano, a mezzo soprano, a soprano, and a soprano sfogato, a term many eventually, uh, many agree eventually gives way to the mezzo. While Rossini wrote a number of operas in which a higher voice, debatably mezzo or soprano, depending on the interpretation of the soprano sfogato definition, held the primary role, three of the more significant and successful operas are Elisabetta, Regina di Litera, Semiramide, and Otello Ossia di Moro di Venezia. All three of these featured Isabella Colbrani in significant roles. Two of these were written in Naples, where Colbrani and Rossini both held a contract with the impresario Domenico Barbaia and had significant roles in the artistic output of, those, of that opera house. Character contrast. In contrast to the characters represented by Marcolini, the operas written for Colbrat fall into two types, queens and daughters of noble birth. In the interest of time, we'll focus here on the Rossinian queen. As shown below the queen characters in these operas, rather than driving the entire plot, as his wily contraltos do, are, they are secondary in plot movement to a male character. The queen characters bear a striking, resent, res, sorry, bear a striking contrast to the contraltos. The soprano queen is the support to the contralto king. The noble, dutiful daughter is a support to her father. And the love interest is often the focus of the triangle or the impetus for the actions of a tenor, rather than the soprano being the driver of the love plot. Therefore, the characters of Colbran must be rescued rather than rescue. And they frequently die noble deaths rather than triumphantly survive. They are, in many ways, the archetype soprano that we see later in Verdi and certainly among contemporaries such as Bellini or Donizetti. This is a striking difference in terms of gender, gender identity. Traditionally, while the countertenor or male alto might be acceptable as king, Rossini also felt that a woman in that role could provide the necessary gravitas. However, when the lead roles are written even a third higher in tessitura, they become supportive and not necessarily the driving force of the opera's plot. While Isabella in Italiana plots and plans to rescue her lover Lindoro, Elcia in Mose di Gito is kidnapped herself and must be rescued. Though it may be hard to determine whether Rossini intends for his contraltos to be feminists, it remains celebrated in many performances. From a recent article about this opera, I think when the Italian girl in Algiers was written, it was really ahead of its time. Composed in 1813 and based on a libretto by Angelo Agnelli, Written in 1808, the Italiana has really progressive views on women at a time when they had very little rights or independence. It's a feminist celebration written by two 19th century men that easily translates into the 21st century. The heroine, Isabella, is a brave and adventurous woman who cannot be outwitted. It's refreshing to see a story where the woman saves the man, Isabella's boyfriend, Lindoro. Semiramide, for example, an opera that featured Colbran in the title role, is referred to by Rossini biographer Richard Osborne this way. Semiramide was Rossini's final Italian opera and could be well dubbed Tancredi Revisited. Much like Tancredi, Semiramide was based on a Voltaire tragedy. However, it's notable that this time, the lead character is not an homage to Primo Uomo, but a queen, and one who dies at the end, passing the power to her king, a heroic contralto. This opera was the very height of Rossini's written out coloratura and holds its most of its historical significance there. But it is also significant that Rossini chooses not to put Colbran in a contralto role for which she may not have been suited, though this was frequently done. Instead of making Colbran king, he writes her the character of queen, perhaps secondary to the king in her journey, to feature the most coloratura and lay in a higher tessitura than the king. The Menso of the 19th century. It is important to understand that during the bel canto era, many of the most popular sopranos might have been called mezzo-sopranos, were they in the 21st century. Much of bel canto in general supported a focus on the middle range of the voice for sustained passages and a higher range for forward passages. So it allowed singers who were not able to sustain high notes to impress audiences regardless. Here's a clip of Desdemona's aria from Rossini's Otello, Tosia di Moro di Venezia, which was originally sung by Isabella Colbran. Comparing the range with that of the roles of Marcolini, the character of Desdemona spans from a D4, that is just the bottom of the staff, 
and just the starting pitch. She only sings this note once, never going back to the bottom of the staff again, to an A-flat five above the staff. The tessitura sits about a fourth higher, mostly ranging from a G4 to an E5. I'd like to play a small clip of the 1978 recording featuring Frederick Rechtstadt. Hopefully this will work well. 